Check one. Oh. All right, welcome everybody, and welcome to anyone viewing online. It's so great to see you all. I am Reverend Mira Solani Joyner. I'm the Minister for Justice, Advocacy, and Change here at the Riverside Church. And we are so delighted to have Jim Wallace here to talk about his Me new Me too. Home. Me too. Me too. I'm going to start us off by reading your bio, although I feel like it's just not enough words to really capture your work in full history, but I'll do my best, OK? Jim Wallace is a writer, teacher, preacher, and justice advocate who believes the gospel of Jesus must be emancipated from its cultural and political captivities. He is a New York Times best-selling author, public theologian, preacher, and commentator on ethics and public life. He is the inaugural holder of the chair in faith and justice the chair in Faith and Justice, and the founding director of the Georgetown University Center on Faith and Justice. In 2022, Washingtonian Magazine named Wallace one of the 500 most influential people shaping policy in DC. Whew. 
He is the founder of Sojourners and is the author of 12 books, including America's Original Sin, Racism, White Privilege, and The Bridge to America. God's, uh, the second book is God's Politics, Why the Right Gets It Wrong and the Left Doesn't Get It. I need to read that book. <laughs> and your latest book is The False White Gospel, Rejecting Christian Nationalism, Reclaiming True Faith, and Refounding Democracy. You don't play, Jim, with these titles. You just don't play. You just get right to the point. And he was a Little League baseball coach for 22 seasons. I did read that. With his sons, Luke and Jack. Wonderful, wonderful. So first, can I say thank you for writing this book? I read a lot of thick books, so I was very grateful that this book is readable, and it's packed full of history, and it gives us really important context for this timely conversation. I think especially during an election year when our democracy is at stake. And so I wanted to start us off by asking, you call attention to the dangers of white Christian nationalism, and it's continued to be a hot topic mm -hmm. for several years. And even before the 2016 elections, I know this topic has been something you've continued to uplift and draw our attention to. Can you talk a little about what led us here and what is different about this moment in history post the 2016 elections, post pandemic, post the Black Lives Matter movement, post the popping up of DEI initiatives across the nation? What is different about this moment? I want to introduce my wonderful St. Martin's team who are here, Elizabeth, Martin, and Jessica. So to have them, they're, they're the ones who made it readable. Mm, thank you. <laughs> so um, the book America's Original Sin talked about how this nation, the most controversial sentence I ever wrote that got the most response was when I said in that book, the United States of America was founded by, by the uh, stealing of the land of indigenous people and committing near genocide against them, then brutally kidnapping Africans and making slaves of them uh, to make our economy grow. And I got responses uh, said, that's courageous, or that's outrageous. It was neither one. It just was a statement of historical fact. So that America's Original Sin, as Brian Stevenson says so well, has evolved and lingered. Uh, Brian says, slavery isn't over, it just continued in different forms. So that America's Original Sin has reached, I think, a crescendo point. It's reached a place of decision-making where white Christian nationalism is fighting for its life. Fighting for its life by any means necessary. And so this isn't just incremental steps, uh, two steps forward, one back. No, this is a moment the Bible would call it a, a kairos time, chronos time, Tick tock, tick tock. Kairos is a time that changes time, changes everything. And we are either going to pass this test of democracy so we can then transform democracy, or we're going to be set back for a long time. So it is a moment. It is more than just uh, things getting worse and worse. It's Eddie Glaude says it well, I quote him in the book, everything is collapsing and everything is possible at the same time. That's right, that's right. And we thought it happened. We thought everything collapsed during the pandemic and we thought that we'd come back and make things different and we didn't. Right. Yeah. So this is a, a test, really. Uh, many people are more and more aware of how this is a test of democracy. It is. Uh, really, since not just my lifetime, but since the Civil War, this is a time of testing of democracy. 
But what I'm trying to talk about in this book is it's also a test of faith, of the integrity of faith communities, and what we're going to do and say and how we're going to stand and speak. And the third test is a test of a new generation who are watching us, watching faith communities to see what we're going to say and what we're going to do. And if we come down, we as communities of faith, on the wrong side, you're going to have a whole new generation that will never come back to church. It is absolutely a test of our faith because we've adopted a a false gospel, as you call it, a false white gospel. And I'm I'm a convert myself to this faith. And in my own journey, as I've converted, I've had to strip away this colonized Christianity and decolonize myself to embrace a more truer expression of our Christian faith. So I wanted to ask, how would you define a true and genuine biblical faith in contrast to the distorted false gospel that has dominated our faith formation? Well, let's first take the name white Christian nationalism. The name spells the problem. First of all, it's white. Now, we're talking about the most radically welcoming, inclusive message in the world, but they make it white. Then it's Christian, but they don't mean service or sacrifice or love. They mean control, domination. In fact, this is an old heresy called dominionist theology, dominion. And then they say it's um, nationalist. I mean, really? I mean, I've been around a long time, but I wasn't on scene when Jesus ascended into heaven. That was before my time. But I've read about that. (laughs) And what he told his disciples, their great commission, you go into every nation, making disciples, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. Nationalism? Really? So the name spells the problem. It's a a distortion. It's a manipulation. It's a um, uh, using religion to gain power. So the book doesn't just stop there with this critique of all of that. Um, People ask me if Donald Trump's religion is idolatrous. Yes, false worship of a nation, co-opted, gospel co-opted by nationalism. Uh, Is it heresy? That's a word that comes up, people are scared, afraid of. Heresy just means it takes away Christians and others from the teachings of Christ, takes them away. Uh, And I think what he's doing, we have news this week of, well, the Bible, he's selling Bibles during Holy Week for his legal fees uh, to help pay legal debts he's got for trials, one coming up about a porn star. And it's not just any Bible, it's a Bible that, what's in the Bible? Well, remember when he went to St. John's? Episcopal, and he held the Bible uncomfortably in his hands, held it upside down. Mm-hmm. That sort of said it all right there, right? Uh, and, and his now this, today, New York Times, a piece about the new Church of Trump, where he's more and more comparing himself, and his followers are, to Jesus. So the Church of Trump and hawking Bibles. Now, Donald Trump once said, He's never had to ask God for forgiveness. He said that. Donald, this would be a good time to do that. Not only is the soul of America in trouble, but I would say his soul is in trouble too. So how do we get back? The rest of the book is about what is true faith? What is the gospel? And I think this book is not just for Christians, but people of other faith traditions uh, and no faith at all. A lot of my students would say they're in the none of the above category, uh, which is not a secular group. 
These are young people who don't affiliate with religion because of what religion's doing or not doing or saying or not saying. Uh, but they most believe in God or something bigger than themselves. My students all the time remind me of this. And, and the rest of the book is saying, okay, let's take six iconic biblical passages, very ancient, but full of wisdom for our time too. You can learn from them whether or not you're a Christian. So I take these texts, every chapter is a text, and I go through them to try and say, and for me it's been texts I knew, but I just really went back into them. More and more commentaries, more and more study, more and more talking with people, uh, st wrestling with them, praying about them. And I found new things in these texts that I think are so uh, resonant with where we are right now. So I want to uh, let Jesus do the talking <laughs> and bring people back to things he said and did. And I think uh, the faith factor in this election is, could be decisive. And I want the faith factor not to be white Christian nationalism, a false white gospel, but the faith factor to, to be like every renewal movement in the history of the church, every revival, every monastic order, always had one thing. Let's go back to Jesus. What did he say? What did he do? And what does that mean now? So this book is an interrogation of faith right now in this country. And I am quite willing, ready to talk to Trump surrogates about these texts. Here's what it says. What does it mean to you? How do we apply it? And the title of the book was going to be, Do We Believe This or Not? Do we believe this or not? So I'm eager to begin this, uh, we're turning a book tour into a town meeting tour around the country on faith and democracy. I'm going to do a lot of listening, a lot of talking to people across the country, and I want to hear what's going on out there. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of those um, six iconic texts that you bring up in your book, these are, these are texts that I've, I talk about when I, say, when I write my prayers, and one of which is the Luke 10, 25 passage that talks about loving God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your body, with all your spirit. And also loving your neighbor. And you ask this question in your book, who is my neighbor, as the primary question for the future of our de democracy. So I wanted to ask, how is our perception of our neighbor being shaped and influenced by politicians and faith leaders? And what, is, what idea of neighbor do we need to recover today? Well, you've hit on the most important question for the future of democracy. A lawyer asked Jesus the question, who is my neighbor? Now the truth is, I think it was a Washington lawyer in the text, because I know that tone of voice. It wasn't, who is my neighbor? How can I, it was like, exactly who is my neighbor? How can I get out of obligations here? So. Yes, who is my neighbor? And Jesus gives him an example, the famous Good Samaritan parable. Now, the Judean audience, which, whom Jesus was speaking to, they didn't think there were any good Samaritans. They were mixed race. They were troublemakers. They were dangerous, false worshipers. They were in cartels, carrying drugs and guns and to America, oh no, that's the other people. <laughs> but they're the ones that we otherize. So here's a Samaritan being otherized by Judeans. But the Jewish scholars tell us the man lying side of the road was a Jew. And here's two religious leaders passing by, too busy on their way to a meeting, didn't care, afraid of their risk. And here's the Samaritan who's being othered helps one who's other to him by the side of the road. 
That's an amazing message. It's not like, Good Samaritan, let's all volunteer more in our spare time. This is who my neighbor is. So the chapter is, your neighbor doesn't live next door. <laughs> so how do we treat people different than us? And as you said, even those who may be our enemies. Yes, that's right. He says, love them too. That's right. That turns everything around. Mm -hmm. It's so hard. It's so hard, but it's, you know, I mean, I've lived on, on or near Jericho roads, right? I know the Jericho Road, very dangerous place. And when someone is, is uh, attacked, you know, the person who attacked them might be just waiting for, mo for more opportunities. To stop to help is a risk. Time, energy, safety, money. And yet this Samaritan stopped to help. And Jesus lifts him up in a very subversive way as the example of what a neighbor is supposed to be. So how do we treat people who are different than we are? If we don't figure that out, we'll never have a multiracial democracy. So the Good Samaritan may help us, may help guide us and lead the way to a multiracial democracy. We have no choice, really. This, yep. this nation is continuing to diversify by 2050. 50% 50 of this nation will be non-white. Right. So we have no choice. Well, but here's the strategy of those who don't want that to happen. Uh, in a sentence, they want to prevent changing demography from changing our democracy. They can't fully stop the change in demography, but through gerrymandering, voter suppression, voter subversion, not counting votes, intimidating poll workers, all that they're doing, they want to keep that changing demography from making a difference in who's making decisions in this country. That's their strategy to make sure that doesn't happen. Yeah. What's the benefit to having diverse voices making decisions in this nation? What, what could we all stand to gain from that? Well, when a presidential candidate or his minions or his surrogates want to tell you that diversity or people different than we are are a threat to us. That's, their trajectory is, they're putting out there is fear, hatred to violence. That's now the tra trajectory of our politics. And rather than seeing diversity as this wonderful gift, which takes proximity. See, most people don't have that proximity. And when moms get together and talk about dads too, but moms even more, they bond over their kids, their kids' health, future, fears, hopes, and dreams. But when 75% of white people today don't have any person or family of color in their circle, that bonding isn't going on. But the book's full of stories, my life's full of stories of people who when they have that proximity, it changes them. It makes them different people. And so the richness of what we're becoming is they make us afraid of it because once we embrace it and know it and feel it, once our kids feel it, it's just all good. You know, 9-11 happens and my son, Luke, watching the news with me, he's a young kid then, and he sees them talking about Muslims. Dad, do you know what they said about Muslims? That's not true. Mohammed's not like that at all. Why did they say that? You know, so in places like, that's why I coach Little League, you know, the, uh, every kid becomes part of the team. And when I told my 12-year-old kids that they're black teammates and schoolmates, have to have a talk with their mom and dad about how to act with, with police, the talk. 
They didn't feel like guilty, as some say, or responsible. They got mad. They're pissed off. <laughs> How can this happen to my teammates and friends? And that was forget for them the beginning of a whole conversation about racial justice. And so it's proximity that changes us, not just ideas floating up here, books that we read, books we read is very important. But it's about that project. So I talk about how that can change it because we then feel it. We don't just say it's good, we feel it. We feel how it's changing our lives, our friendships, our relationships. Thomas Merton once said, everything is about relationships. That's right, that's right. Everything, yeah. and he's right. And proximity changed you in your own journey, right? This is what oh, yeah. led to where you are now. Can you say a little bit more about that? Well, uh, I remember my first conversion. You see, evangelicals, that's my tradition, have many conversions. I think evangelicals need many conversions. There's an evangelical scholar out there, I think he knows what I'm saying. Uh, my first one came on a Sunday night when a revival preacher showed up. We were warned he was fiery, and all the unsaved kids had to sit in the front row. Because the closer you are to a sermon, the more impact it may have on your life. So he pointed, it felt like, right at me, like I'll, I was sitting where Martin was. And he said, if Jesus came back tonight, your mommy and daddy would be taken to heaven and you would be left all by yourself. I remember that. <laughs> it got my attention. I was growing up in years, I was six. <laughs> And I realized I'd have a five-year-old sister to support. And so I asked my mom how to fix this. And she says, no, 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 forget that rat stuff. God loves you. God has a plan for your life. So I signed up. Seemed cool, better than the revival preacher. But that was my first convert. The second one came when I was a teenager, to your question. And I began listening to my city. I'm 15, 16, which means I'm reading the papers in Detroit hearing the news, having adult conversations, just paying attention. And something really big seemed really wrong, and nobody would talk about it in my white world, church, neighborhood, school. And so I tell my students now, uh, trust your questions and follow them to wherever they lead you to find the answers. So I wasn't getting any answers. Like I said, how come white Detroit seems so different than black Detroit? How come I'm reading about people hungry, even not very far away from us, or people who have family in jail? We didn't know any of that. And I hear there are black churches. How come we've never visited, or anybody's visited us? What's going on here? No answers, except the only honest one was, son, if you keep asking these questions, you're gonna get into a lot of trouble. That proved to be true. So I went, and I just showed up at black churches with my naive white boy questions. And they took me in from, from jump and began to just patiently answer my questions. That's why I always, I felt so welcomed. Eventually I've been kicked out of my church, welcomed in by black churches. Uh, and, and I had these epiphanies, <laughs> these moments uh, where proximity changed the way I was thinking. Like my friend Butch, who was a janitor like I was at this company, elevator operator. I'm so old, I was an elevator operator, <laughs> sitting on seats when the old guys were on vacation or sick. And he and I would have these jobs right up and down, and on his breaks he'd ride with me and talk, on mine I would ride with him. Took me home to meet his, his mother and siblings, father had passed, and Butch was one of those young, radical guys in Detroit with Franz Fanon in his khaki pocket, you know. And, and his mother said, heard us talking about the police. His mother said, his mother said, um, yeah, well, that's why I always tell my kids, if you ever lost and can't find your way home and see a policeman duck under a stairwell, hide behind a building, wait till he passes, and find your way home. And the words of my mother to her five kids screamed into my head. Ever lost? 
can't find your way home, look for a policeman. The policeman is your friend. So those things kept happening. And then I looked more, per not just personally, but structurally. And I learned when my dad got home from World War II on a Navy ship, a destroyer, all GIs like my dad got a GI Bill for their education, FHA loan for their first house. When you get housing and education, you're middle class. Biggest affirmative action program in American history. My government made me and us middle class. No black sailors on his ship got that. No black GIs got that because of redlining and Jim Crow. And so it was a decision to racialize geography by the government, which made my neighborhood white, my church white, my school white. These weren't accidental things, right? So I began to see how this was structural, built into our system. And that, it continues to be my experience that I learn most and my worldview changes the most when I'm with people I was never supposed to meet, never supposed to know, never supposed to become friends with, and never listen to. Please say that again because that was really beautiful. You learn most. My worldview, your world my, my understanding of the world around me has changed most when I've been with people I was never supposed to know, meet, talk to, or become friends with. So that is what changes us yeah. time and time again. Yeah, that's truly transformative. And I think we're really lucky in New York City that we are around people from various cultures various socioeconomic backgrounds. And here, right here at Riverside Church, I was just sharing with Jim that 50% of our congregation is, are people of color. Yeah. That there's huge age diversity here as well. Um, we, the church started as an interdenominational church. And we frequently have people of other faiths come here and speak as well. And I know that your book is framed not only as a message to Christians, but to people of all faiths. Yeah. And even those without faith. So. There's a need to build coalition here. So how do you envision fostering a sense of civic faith that's based on love, healing, and hope to counteract the fear, hate, and violence in our politics and our society? Well, let's take another text. This one, uh, a Jewish text. Um, the first chapter, first book of the Bible, Genesis 126. I love the beginning of that text because I imagine myself being surrounded by all the political noise, yes. which I am all the time. In fact, part of my vocation is to surround myself with the noise and try and figure it out, try and discern the times, try and bring perspective to all that. So. The beginning of that text opens up with this line I love. It says, imagine all the noise around. Then God said, be quiet. Then God said, then the next words are, let us create all humankind in our own image, after our own likeness. And God did it. Now, all of our earthly talk about human rights that you work on all the time, civil rights, voting rights, is because of that notion of the created equality of all of us, all of humankind, all of God's children, which then you apply that. So I'm doing a lot of work around voter suppression. It's all in the book. We're in 10 key battleground states uh, trying to protect against voter suppression. So I figured out that any attempt to suppress a vote, subvert a vote, deny a vote, not count a vote because of the color of somebody's skin or anything else is literally, theologically, an assault on Imago Dei. That's right. That's an attack on the image of God. So when I'm talking to, I won't say which state, a secretary of state, in a battleground state. We have these conversations. 
about fairness and equity and rules and what we can expect. And I said, you're a Christian, right? Oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes. I said, uh, do you know that text in Genesis? And I he says, of course. I said, have you ever pl applied that to voting rights? He said, no. How would that apply? And I explained how it might apply. He said, I've never thought about that before. I'm going to have to think about that. So how do we apply these things? And to me, um, there's a hunger out there for a different kind of faith. My students, uh, they often say, I never heard about the black church before this class. Or as I'm in Georgetown, I never heard about Catholic social teaching before this class. And when they hear about a different kind of faith, they're very drawn to it. And so they're gonna find their own way. But how faith communities respond in these next few months, right here and now, how we come down historically when these choices are so clear, you can't be neutral about them. It's not just political, there are moral, theological, spiritual choices here that have to be made. And we could, we could really win a whole generation if we show courage. And I, I've been saying, to me, the timing of this book was uh, uh, determined by, by uh, my publishing team and the Holy Spirit working together, I think. And so, and so we're launching this at Easter. It's an Easter book for me. Yeah. It combines resistance and hope at the same time. So I'm going out to this Easter, and Easter isn't for us a day, it's a season, right? right. So it's time not to just critique and confront and be against. We've got to find, search for, and find the hope that gives us the courage to act. That's right. I want to go back on this notion of the Imago Day and taking it to the polls because I think that we do a we do a decent job or we try to do a decent job of doing it. But I think with this this white Christian nationalism, what it does is that it's divisive. And so while we are we think of our own preserving our own Imago Day often when we go to the polls. And but because of a white Christian nationalism which intersects with patriarchy homophobia, anti-black sentiment, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, all the isms um, how, that are all rooted in white supremacy, essentially. How do we navigate these divisive politics and social landscapes? Like, how would you suggest individuals that are sitting here right now or listening online have these difficult conversations with people who are friends, coworkers, fellow congregants, I think you talked about this in Georgetown as well uh, when you spoke a few days ago, and I'm, I think many of us are interested to hear when it involves our identity, preserving ourselves, yeah. me as a right. woman, as an immigrant here to this nation, how can I take the Imago Dei to the souls and have those really crucial conversations with family? So as an immigrant, you became a citizen about two years ago? Yes, that's yes. right. Okay, so you're in the middle of this in your own personal life and all the legalities and structures and registering the vote and all that stuff. So this is very personal, right, for you. And you're a, you're a pastor, you're a theologian, so you're reflecting on all. I'd love to hear your answer to your question. But my input would be, um, you know, how, how do we understand what kind of people, what kind of nation, what kind of future do we want to have? And um, uh, these are choices that we're now making. My wife was, is a Brit, not was, she still is, but she became a citizen here too. And so uh, the more that we can surround ourselves, and I like to walk the streets in New York, like after a show last night, I walked through Times Square, crazy Times Square, the epitome of consumer culture, everything is for sale. 
and the ads keep changing over and over again. It's like, this is the world we're living in. And Times Square just sort of symbolizes that. So what does it mean to have a different kind of value system than that? And my two boys, young, young men now, uh, they and a lot of their friends who I know very well are really hungry for something different than that. That's why uh, this direction could be such a gift for us. Another text that I'll bring up here is Jesus says, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Set you free. Everyone could have answered that. That doesn't mean the opposite of truth is just lying less. The opposite of truth is captivity. Yes. Captivity. Freedom and truth are indivisible. So what's out there is not just people who think they're right and we're wrong. They're captive. Yes. They're captive. They're, they're living without the truth. And that's not good for people, for religion, for democracy. So telling the truth about white supremacy, which is, you know, white supremacy is a term that we're all against that, right? But it's white privilege, and underneath that, it's the whole idea of whiteness, which is an idol. Mm -hmm. So when I hear about white evangelicals, the first thing I realize is the word that defines the phrase is not evangelical. It's white. Black evangelicals, there are black evangelicals, very different than white evangelicals. You told me here you're an evangelical, right? Uh, white Christian. White Christianity, the phrase, is an idolatry that people are stuck in. So I'm not just saying in this book, you're wrong and I'm right. We get stuck in who's wrong and who, who's right. Uh, it's more, how do we deal with people who are, who are stuck, who are oblivious, who are living in captivity, which might make them feel righteous some days, but not finally happy. Mm -hmm. So we're offering not just tell them they're wrong and join our side, how do we help set people free? So the whole truth chapter there is about how do we find the truth? How do we know it? How do we help set people free? And Pontius Pilate, the great Roman ruler of the Jews, uh, was having a debate with Jesus on the day of his crucifixion about the truth. What's the truth? What's the truth? And Pontius Pilate was losing the debate. <laughs> So then he finally says, well, what is truth anyway? And washes his hands and crucifies Christ. Strong men want to undermine the idea of the truth itself. There is no truth. It's alternative facts. It's fake news. It's the press, the enemy, the people. They want to undermine the idea of the truth, not just lie all the time, idea of the truth so everyone will believe the strong man's version of the truth. So I want to look at the folks who are not yet persuaded uh, as not just bad and wrong, but captive, and captive to idols that finally are false worship. To worship whiteness is a false worship, and that's not going to make life good or happy for those people? Uh, people who are oblivious and who are in captivity of this idolization of whiteness and worship, false worship of whiteness, do you think that this is the job just for white folks? Well, I'll, first I want you to answer your own question. <laughs> uh, so you're an, an immigrant yeah. and you became a citizen and you were, we were talking about voter registration and all that. Um, so, and you're a theological person. So what is your theological reflection on what you found here in the US? 
on voting, the voting no, rights, I'm, or general? No, identity. Oh, your identity. identity. Their identity, your identity, how those fit together and all that stuff. You know, I don't, I didn't feel more Asian than I have, I've never felt more Asian until I moved here. Mm -hmm. Because I, it stuck out like a sore thumb and was always be, viewed as a perpetual foreigner. And nobody talks about Asians. Asians are invisible, completely invisible. When we talk about race, people don't talk about Asians. So that was rough. That was rough because I experienced... A model minority. Yeah, there's that too. There's that because we, I think, while Stereotype. we... And we combat that, yeah. the image of the, the model minority, but at the same time, we find um, a sense of safety behind it. Mm -hmm. If I just behave, if I just listen to all the rules, if I get straight A's, if I do all the right thing, then I'm safe. People will leave me alone. Uh -huh. And, but what happened in the, during the pandemic is that it didn't matter what you did. It didn't matter how much money you had, where you were educated. As an Asian person, you were a target. Suddenly, you were the person that brought COVID. And I think for anyone who presents as South Asian, I think they experienced that during 9-11. Mm -hmm. They were a target, whether right. they got amazing grades or they were a doctor or a lawyer, it didn't matter. They were seen as a terrorist. And that's what I bring to the polls now, is I don't just think about, I think about the need for me. I mean, I can't vote right now. I hope to, but because, and that's a long story. I hope to real soon. In the, in the upcoming elections in November. But when I do vote, it won't just be for me, it'll be for all of us, because I know what it felt like to be Asian and invisible. We all saw that horrible video of an older Asian woman in New York just walking down the street and got just savagely beaten. Uh, a good friend of mine is the president of the National Association of Evangelicals mostly white group. He's Asian-American. He's a scholar, he's pastor of big old church down in uh, Charlottesville. And he never, walking from the parking lot of the church, got heckled before or verbally abused before COVID because, of course, he's Chinese. He's not Chinese, but all Asians became Chinese who brought the pandemic. And so my experience with particularly uh, young Asian students in Georgetown, is it's deepened the solidarity of young Asian students, activists with Black Lives Matter, young activists. That's right. It's brought people more to, together. Is that what you've seen? Yes, I've definitely seen that. We've, we've seen that we need to have a stake in this fight now. Right. And we need to uplift the live, Black lives Palestinian lives, the lives of queer folks, marginalized people, Latinx people, refugees, asylum seekers, because we've all been made invisible at some point. And it doesn't matter, we can worship whiteness in all its ways, it does not give us safety. Right. It doesn't guarantee our freedom. That's right. At the end of the day, once we're labeled as a threat, that's it. I love it when Ordinary people stand up to that. There's a story in the book that I just love where a friend of mine, his father is a Presbyterian pastor in the South, Georgia, and his, his mother is the wife of the pastor. So in a very typical rural Georgia setting, the pastor's wife uh, is a member of the choir. Very common. And the choir, practices before every service Sunday morning. At the end of the practice, the choir director says a prayer for the service in the choir. And on this one Sunday morning, with all the cartel immigrant language out there, she starts to pray, and Lord, protect us from those terrible cartels those rapists and killers and drug dealers and, and they're bringing leprosy. <laughs> uh, protect us from, and protect our soldiers who are gonna fight them and protect us. And the wife of the pastor says, stop, stop, stop. That's not true. And we don't lie in church. Amen. <laughs> she just stopped. The con now, 
and, and everyone loves her, she's wonderful, but she says, that's not true, and we don't do that, in, we don't lie in church. And she had credibility, and she was standing up for what she believes, and all of us are influencers. Family, friends, workplaces, where we live, who we go to our religious services with, and we all need to stand up and speak out, just like she did. Take a risk. You talk it's about it. It's always that. a risk. Yes. Yeah. But I, I said uh, uh, on Morning Joe's morning, I said, uh, "This is just my two cents. I want it to spark other people's two cents for what they can do, and I believe in a God who increases the value of all of our two cents." So the book is meant to be a tool mm -hmm. uh, for people to use, uh, to find the language, to find the passages, to think them through again. Um, and one thing that I say that's kind of controversial, but I'll say it again, every movement has to figure out who they can persuade and who they must defeat. Nonviolently, at the ballot box, but we have to persuade as many people. If I didn't believe there were persuadable people, I wouldn't have written the book. But some people, they're not gonna be persuaded. They're militant religious political actors. And they'll distort and use uh, and confuse people as much as they can. And in a few months, we have to defeat them at the ballot box. Mm -hmm. Amen. Um, I wanted to. I wanted you to talk about this story. Actually, um, when you were in community with the Sing Sing folks who were doing the clergy, uh, the clergy program, the clergy. What was it? A it's New York Theological Seminary here in town, and they have a program at Sing Sing uh, that you can be a prisoner at Sing Sing and get a certificate. That's right. In divinity. That's right. And they train pastors. It's in the prison. I just want you to make it's that connection. It's a wonderful program that should be all over the country, but it isn't. So I got involved with it when I got a letter after writing another book a long time ago. Um, it said, we've read your book. People always write you when you're an author. We've read your book. Could you come and talk to our group? You know, so they said, uh, every author gets those. People in the audience have gotten those letters. Uh, could you come and unpack it for us? By the way, we're inmates at Sing Sing Prison in upstate New York. Interesting letter. Uh -huh. So I wrote back and I said, well, sure. When do you want me to come? And the young brother writes back, well, we're free most nights. <laughs> Got nowhere to go? We're, we're kind of a captive audience here. So I worked it out with the New York Theological Seminary, and I went up there and I had about 50 guys for three hours in the bowels of Sing Sing. And the one who invited me said, Jim, we want you to understand that most of us here at Sing Sing are from three or four or five neighborhoods in New York City. It's like a train comes through our zip codes. You get on the train when you're nine or 10 years old, the train ends up here at Sing Sing. But the young man said, but I, I've been converted inside these walls. And when I get out, I'm gonna go back and stop those trains. Mm -hmm. So I actually ended up telling that story at other commencements. I did their commencement one year. They're all in suits from, you know, thrift stores, and I got to go through security to get, to get to the commencement, and they're all graduating. Some are staying in prison, their sentences and up, some are going into the world. And I've used that story at commencements at Stanford or other places saying, what trains are you going to stop? Yeah. Here are all these trains. What trains are we going to stop? And that's really a call to faith and action. So 
uh, Sing Sing taught me a lot about what it means to uh, put life and faith together when this train comes only to certain zip codes and people get on it. How do we turn those trains around? So that could be any of our systems, all our systems, housing, education, economics, like my dad's FHA, GI. These are structural things. And we're in our segregated worlds because we're put there. We're put there. And until we break our patterns and get out of those structures, and I think that could happen in schools, churches, synagogues, mosques, in sports, that's why I love coaching young kids in sports, because they become a family, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. That's why I wanted you to mention that story. I thought it was really provocative and really yeah, powerful. A great story. And it speaks of this, you talk about remnant church. Yeah. And I think there's a potential for all of our churches to reimagine and rebirth since it's Easter tide a remnant church, but can you say more about that? Yeah, and then I'd love to get some of these folks involved in the conversation, particularly on this remnant church. Yes, last one, I promise. <laughs> so, so um, I say in the book how Dietrich Bonhoeffer, this young German pastor, was at Union Seminary for a year before he went back to Germany. And while he was here, he went to Abyssinian Baptist Church, probably the only white kid in the congregation every Sunday. But Reggie Williams, a wonderful scholar on all this, who I just talked to yesterday, in fact, shares how the preaching and music and liturgy and worship of black churches really shaped the confessing church that he and Karl Barth and others founded to resist the rise of the Third Reich, for which he was hung in a concentration camp. So we need our version of that confessing church. Yes. So the term I'm kind of just thinking about is a remnant church. So a remnant church would, would be um, a minority of white believers particularly younger white believers, who decide they want to join together with black and brown leaders of the churches to form literally a new American church. A new American church. So I don't want to just be against the old stuff. I want to be able to look forward to what we could become to, together. If democracy wins this battle in November, we're not done with this battle. No matter who wins the White House, we're gonna be back at it again. And we better have a deeper vision than just Republican and Democrat. Don't go left, don't go right, go deeper. What does that mean? So how do, how do we form, what are the elements of that kind of remnant church? How would it meet? Where would it meet? Where would a church here that used to be uh, not so diverse? I've been preaching here a long time through three or four pastors, and it wasn't always a diverse church. And I say about half the congregation is. So how does a church like this uh, that's trying to do this and you're struggling still with generational struggles, older and younger. You're struggling with affluent and less affluent. Um, how, do we, how do we do that? And one of the texts, this will be my last text I'll raise, the Galatians text, Galatians 3.28. This is the one that you all know. We're in Christ, there's no, in Christ, there's no, Jew or Gentile, bond and free, male or female, we're all one in Christ. What I learned in studying that text afresh is that text was a baptismal text in the early church, a baptismal formula. They read it every baptism, every baptism, they read that scripture as if to say, 
Well, we're the followers of this itinerant brown-skinned rabbi named Jesus who has told us that we have to bring down these pillars, these divisive pillars of race, class, and gender. We're told to overcome those, to break them down. Now, we're not perfect. We often make mistakes. But this isn't, for us, extracurricular. It's vocational. It's what we do and who we are. So if you don't want to be a part of that kind of community, breaking down the barriers, you better go somewhere else because you won't be happy here. What if we saw American churches citing Galatians 3.28 yes. at every baptism with that same message? Now, interestingly enough, I discovered Galatians 3.28 was taken out of every slaveholder Bible. Removed the Bible at Fisk University in the museum there. No Galatians 3.28, not there. Dangerous text. So that means our congregations are supposed to be places, and not every church being integrated in the same way. We've got different kind of churches in the same community, but how can they connect? How can they build relations? How can they work together on common things in the community? Like when young people pass a church, they may say, I'm not sure I believe all the stuff they believe in that church, but that's where we meet to solve issues of gun violence in our community. That's where we all gather and meet. So that's why I go there, you know? So I want to see that kind of remnant church come together uh, beyond where, where we are now, because we don't have that multiracial democracy yet that we need. And if we're able to help shape that, this will be the first nation in the history of the world with a genuine multiracial democracy. Yes. So this is worth fighting for. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And with that, I'd like to open the floor to some of our congregants that are here this evening to ask your own questions of anything that Jim has shared this evening. Thank you so much. Uh, there's a mic right in the center aisle there if you can line up with your questions. And just one by one, don't be shy. Now, I know some of you, so I know you've got some questions. Don't be shy, please, jump in. Here we go. Good evening. I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation, and congratulations on your new book. I look forward to reading it. Thank you. Uh, I'm a member here at the Riverside Church, and I've had a vision for some time about presenting a forum or a symposium that would engage a conversation around a book entitled Honest Patriots by Dr. Donald Shriver, who's a member here. I, 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 I'm I sure you Shriver. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure it's a colleague, former colleague and a comrade. Uh, I had put in a presentation or a proposal uh, about some sort of forum that would discuss the content of his book around creating narratives in cities throughout the country that would form as markers uh, to cre create a historic uh, trail of the challenges of racism and how each city and each county virtually in the United States has had some intersection uh, with race and racism uh, over a period. And his wonderful book does such a fine account of examining the three entities, South Africa, Germany, and the United States in uh, terms of uh, the fascism and the racism uh, and apartheid and of course Jim Crow. And he looked at those markers and how each of those nations had grappled with placing markers and creating monuments and creating an educational presence, a trail that people could connect with.
to never forget that black people had their origins in that trail building, not just the Underground Railroad, but individual cities like Pittsburgh. I was in Pittsburgh several years ago, and I'm going to make a chart, but I came here because I wanted to broach this with you. I approached the church about doing a program that would engage this conversation, and I wanted to meet you and share that vision with you because I think the book is so powerful. And given that we have some limits on critical race, the idea of what it is, and the unfortunate misguided attempts to uh, eradicate black history and any kind of history that deals with race in our schools. Right. It's incumbent upon the politicians and the Congress to create the narratives in the cities and at the county and state level to ensure that people never forget the black presence in this country. That's right. Thank you. So it's always good to ask where our churches came from and how they got started. So there were these places called the Hush Harbors where slaves went to practice their religion apart from their white slave masters just by themselves. They would sneak off and get by themselves. They would learn to read there and then read the Bible there. They would organize underground railroad journeys there. They, hush harbors were, were quiet places where the black church was born. The black church comes from the hush harbors. So think about that for a moment. Uh, which American church, think of them all, our American churches, which American church has had the most impact on the rest of the world? The black church. There's no doubt about that. The black church in America has had more impact around the world, inspired things in South Africa, inspired things all over the world, uh, more than any other American church. And they came from the hush harbors, the margins, the edges. What does that tell us about church and power? Brian Stevenson, who I love and talk about in the book, uh, I was there years ago leading with a retreat for a lot of faith leaders, and he took us around to these trees in Montgomery, Alabama, under which black men had been lynched. And he had us dig up dirt from the ground under those trees and put it in these vases that they stored that became the foundation of now the museum that, that he has down there that you've got to go and see it, right? So where we're from, figuring that out is really important. To us, or the church, because that trail is all over the country, and 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 it's not like again a history that we should learn because we need to, need to know it and feel really bad about ourselves. No, that that's a caricature. It's a trail that can nourish us and inspire us. Uh, Brittany Packnett a dear friend of mine from, I met on the streets in Ferguson. She's at Georgetown just two weeks ago uh, on the day I do policing in my class. And my class got to talk with, with her and hear from her. <coughs> and she said, how do you have hope? Someone said, how do you have, Brittany? look what's going on. She's one of the most articulate, eloquent, courageous activists that we have on policing around the country, and she said, I have to have hope because of my ancestors. Look what they did. Look what they suffered. Look what they kept generations together. Because we're having a hard time, bad time, 
I shouldn't have hoped. That'd be a betrayal of my ancestors, you know? So the powers that be want us, they want us to be cynical, skeptical, disengaged, and withdrawn, because they win. They win. So that, those trails, that history, can not just tell us what happened, but how we can move forward. And it immobilizes us as well. When we, when we are cynical, yeah, yeah. We, and we have no hope, we don't take action. Now, Isaac Sharp is here, and he knows something about your author there. You want to speak to that question, Isaac? We, we, we can talk, yeah, I, I did a... Isaac, do you mind coming up to the mic so that our friends who are listening online can hear as well? And if you have any questions, uh, please post it on the chat section and I'll read it out. Would love to, love to connect these different loops here uh, because I uh, have written about Jim and his story and have also done a fest shrift for Don Shriver uh, and his career defining work there at the end. So I published a book called Christian Ethics and Conversation, which includes a bunch of stuff about Shriver's work. So, and I'm over at Union Seminary, so we should talk. Let me push his book. It's called The Other Evangelicals. He wrote a, it's a great book about uh, black evangelicals, progressive evangelicals, feminist evangelicals, mm -hmm. gay evangelicals who were there but got left out and pushed aside by literally a political takeover mm -hmm. of evangelicalism, not by conservative Christians, but by the far right, mm -hmm. which I talk about in the book. So we have a question from our online audience from Derek Bainia-Misa, who is one of the chairs of our Mission and Social Justice arm. Oh, great. Um, um, he says, he writes, if you are familiar with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech at the staff retreat at Penn Center, Frogmore, South Carolina, could you comment on this speech and the plan for a transformed world it represented? Which speech? The staff retreat at Penn Center, Frogmore, South Carolina. Okay. Well, I have all his speeches. I'm not sure I remember. No, it's very specific. Details. Maybe speak on a plan for a transformed world. Oh, well, I can speak to that uh, from him. He's all over the book. <laughs> um, one of the things he said that is relevant to our topic right here, right now, is he said, the church needs to be reminded that we're not supposed to be the masters of the state, mm. nor the servants of the state, but the conscience yes. of the state. We don't take over and impose our religion, our doctrine through force of law, power, uh, and we don't just clean up the mess of the victims of the systems. Uh, religious folks are really good at pulling bodies out of the river. We're good at that. We do it well. You gotta send somebody upstream to see what or who is throwing them in. That's right. And King spoke to that. So we don't take over the state nor just clean up their mess quietly. But we gotta be the conscience mm -hmm. of the state get to the root of the systems yeah. and the structures. Right. That's right. We have another one. Claudia Canesto asks, are you still in touch with Michael Lerner and his network of spiritual progressives, a group co-founded by Cornell West, who is running for president of the United States? Michael Lerner had a magazine called Tikkun, which is a wonderful Jewish word for healing, and so we work together on some things. I think he's kind of retired now, but he's still around, and he still has a wonderful voice. And there are lots of coalitions out there, lots of, again, it's the relationship thing. Yes. Uh, and I, I'm particularly blessed because I've been around a long time, so I've got a lot of relationships. And, and they're all coming out around this, this crisis, this critical moment. 
So a whole lot of relationships, some way in the past and some current, are, all, are now in touch saying, what do we do, what do we do, what do we do? So uh, all those names and people are ones I've worked with before. Cornell and I got arrested at Ferguson uh, in the first part of that because they wanted, they were just starting, and they wanted uh, Cornell and I to lead a group of young people and clergy and get arrested at the famous police station. And here's an inside story about Cornell, which you've never heard. So we're leading this demonstration right to the police, you know, shields and guns and all the rest. And somebody said, let's kneel. Of course, we knelt to pray. And we just were kneeling and praying. And Cornell, sorry, Cornell, he whispers to me and says, Jim, my knees are killing me. I can't just keep kneeling for this long time. I'm, knees are killing me. Um, can you get them to stand up? They would listen to you. <laughs> Let's rise, all we all rose. <laughs> so those moments with people like Cornell. Uh, so I think it's gonna be relationships that save us here. Amen. So how do we bring together all these, underneath the coalitions and networks and organizations, there are relationships. Uh, like. I've had with the pastors of this church down through the years. Very important to me, they helped shape me, and I'm still in touch with Jim Forbes, by the way, uh, who I know this place loved and I loved him, still do. So how do we build on those relationships? It's a time to build on the relationships that can sustain us and sustain the kind of future that we're talking about. I have a Sumati Devadat that has another question about progressive churches. What could we do better to advance social justice that makes a real difference in the, lived, in the lives of people who are hurting? Yeah. Well, back to Ferguson for a minute. Um, I'm part of something called the Faith Table. It's not an organization. It's a gathering, uh, one retreat a year, and a monthly conference call. And it's about whatever's going on, COVID, immigration, uh, all kinds of things. And we don't try to homogenize, we harmonize. So never make a press statement or never, but when you see things happening in, from faith leaders, they're often things that have been discussed on that conference call. And we have our annual retreat, and right at Ferguson, when, when uh, Michael Brown was killed, we went to Ferguson, had the retreat. And, um, and Brittany Packnett, one of the Black Lives Matter leaders on the street, and the others joined us for a whole evening together. And uh, it was a very powerful moment, because um, many there in the room were prophetic preachers. And Otis Moss III, who I just love, one of the most important voices in the country, uh, pastor at Trinity Church in Chicago, he heard those young people speak and he said, I preach prophetically. My father, Otis Moss Jr., was in the inner circle with Dr. King. He was at our table when I was a kid. I went to Morehouse. I'm here preaching at Jeremiah Wright's church. I'm the successor. I do prophetic preaching. But tonight I've learned a lot of things from you that are going to transform me because I'm preaching from a place of comfort. Yes. Prophetic preaching from a place of comfort. There's been a lot of prophetic preaching. I've stood in that pulpit, There's, and I've heard prophetic preaching. But still, we're often in a place of comfort. And Otis said, when I go home, I want to go out to the streets. I want to meet the street youth on the south side of Chicago who aren't coming to our churches. I want to meet them. I want to... I want to go out to them, not force them to come into us. 
how do I take the good news out to them? And, and he went home and he did that. And in amazing ways, the Black Youth Project in Chicago is Black Lives Matter. And he reached out to those young people and he made a, a tremendous difference. And when I got to preach at Trinity Church a year later, uh, in his study afterwards, I was in a discussion about the sermon with Black Youth Project leaders who were not coming to his church and talked about the meaning of this on the streets. Um, so sometimes our churches are saying the right things, even speaking prophetically, but we don't have the proximity yes. of the streets. We're not meeting and engaging. Uh, Greg Boyle, who was an amazing Jesuit priest in, in, in LA, uh, homeboys, this whole thing. When I'm with Jeff, with, with Greg in his place, we always sit on a chair where you can look out the window. He's always looking out the window. Even his place, which is so warm and welcoming of gang leaders, they're kids who won't come in. And they're kind of sauntering around the street outside. He spots them, excuse me for a minute, and walks outside, huddles in, on the street. How do we take our message to the streets? and not just preach it in comfortable churches. That's right, that's right. That's really powerful, thank you for that. And we have come to the end of our program for this evening. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for all your questions. A big thank you to the Anti-Racism Task Force for submitting questions for this evening as well, who are a sponsor of this event. Um, they plan on doing a book study on your book. Yeah, so make sure you get your copy. If you're not here, uh, they, you, where, what, where can they get their copy? Where can they get the copy? Everywhere, all major um, book distributors. Yeah. It, today's launch day, yes. so they're going into bookstores today. Barnes and Noble and other places around. Wonderful, and if you're Amazon. here on Amazon, if you're here in person, you can buy right outside those doors. Get your copy and join a, when we launch the book study, join the book study. So you can learn more about how we can get engaged into, in this work. So we can really dive into those six passages and get uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. Can you do me a favor? Yes. So I'm not assuming any of our religious traditions here, but you can speak to that diverse world. Could you close us in a word of prayer? I was going to ask you to No, do I'm asking you. That. I'm asking you. <laughs> I would love to close us in a, world, in a word of prayer. And I also want to plug another event that's coming up, a few events that are coming up. This is the first of our Decon Decolonizing Christianity series. And in person, we will have Reverend Mitri Reheb and Dr. Kwok Poi Lan come and speak about decolonizing Christianity and how the Bible has been weaponized. So sign up for that event, come here in person to listen to them speak. Dr. Mitri Rahim will also be selling his book here. Uh, we have, I don't know if you're familiar with Mark Charles, but he's uh, written a book about, uh, why am I forgetting the title of his book? Unsettled Truths about um, much of what you talked about in this evening. So he will be uh, presenting a book club this Saturday. We have so many things going on. So this is just one of many, 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 many conversations that you can read up, read about, find out more information on our website. All right, let us pray. Heavenly God, I thank you for the courageous spirit of Jim Wallace and his words that these wise words that he's given us, this call he's given us to show up and recover a true and more genuine faith, one that is divorced of a false white gospel, one that recovers your true intention. So I pray, God, that as we go out of this space and out into the world, that we recover what Jesus really meant when he said, love your neighbor that we identify the Imago Dei in not just people that look just like us, 
who, who have the same color of skin as us, who even live in the same, neighbors, in the same neighborhood as us, that we find the Imago Day in everybody, God, and that we lift their well-being um, at the polls when we talk to our legislators, when we talk to our representatives, and everything that we do in the difficult conversations that we have, that we uplift the most vulnerable and the marginalized amongst us. In your name we pray, amen. I was gonna turn into a Baptist prayer, so I had to stop. <laughs> Thank you again for joining us this evening. Be blessed.